you know, the biggest bulls might not be as visible as the smaller bulls, but if you're seeing 280, 300 class, six points on the regular in a, in a bachelor group, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that there's probably a, a, a big bull in there. Oh, that's, that's really good advice. I don't think it's ever been said on the podcast. Hey, fellow elk fanatics, if you're completely obsessed with elk hunting like me, then join me every Wednesday for tips, tactics, and stories on elk hunting from elk hunting legends to fellow DIYers. This is the Rich Outdoors Wapiti Wednesday. This episode of Wapiti Wednesday brought to you by Phelps Game Calls. Phelps Game Calls are hands down my favorite diaphragms, and I've tested, I've tried out just about every diaphragm on the market, and the amp frame is what I carry. The amp frame, not only is it is extremely easy to use, but they're the most consistent calls you can find and extremely durable. As someone who can blow out a diaphragm in just a few days, the first time I used one of the new amp frame calls, I was blown away at how long it lasted. I can get a few weeks out of a single Phelps diaphragm versus a couple days out of just about any other diaphragm on the market. Personally, I like the amp gray and the amp white, but if you don't have any idea what to use or what to try, just grab four or five of them and see what you like. You know, some of you guys are going to like locating on one and some of you guys are gonna like the sexy cow calls on another but either way i think you'll be able to use any of them they all sound great and they all work super well uh it's just kind of all on personal preference a couple of you guys have asked me about the big bat bugles and if they're necessary for me 100 percent, i am naked in the woods without my bat bugle the Phelps bat just gives me so much more reach when i'm bugling as far as being able to be louder and carry a bugle farther into a canyon if you only want to be the kind of guy that slips into a herd and el- herd of elk and doesn't do a whole lot of screaming challenge bugles uh, even the, just having the bat as a locating tool is crucial. You can carry that bugle so much farther, locate a bull, a bull from farther away. And to me, it's an essential item in my toolkit. Go get yourself some Phelps game calls before they sell out. Before season comes, get to practicing, get good at it. Use the TRO code and you'll get free shipping off your entire order. This episode brought to you by Backcountry Fuel Box. Backcountry Fuel Box is my newest creation. It's a monthly subscription box full of backcountry meals, snacks, bars, and all kinds of cool high energy options for your next backcountry adventure. I started the box because I wanted a way to try out all the cool new backcountry food options that were on the market. And also, so I would always have stuff on hand for my own adventures. There's just so many cool new options available. The June box had all kinds of great products and new companies that I think most people have probably never heard of. Brands like Four Points Bars, Peak Refuel, Dark Mountain Energy, just to name a few. All in all, the June box was packed full with 10 awesome products and discount codes to all the companies within the box. Enough to taste test a few of the items and to hide the rest in my tote for September. The box is thirty three thirty a month, but if you use the TRO at checkout, use the TRO code, you'll get the box for twenty nine ninety seven a month, and it is full of awesome stuff that you're actually going to use. Also, I just want to say a big shout out to all of you who have been sharing the box when you get it on social media. I am thoroughly humbled by the dozens and dozens of people that have been helping grow this thing, and it really does mean the world to me. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. There's a whole bunch of awesome stuff coming from the, this whole backcountry fuel project and you guys have been awesome and instrumental in helping me get there and uh, kind of grow this whole thing so if you guys haven't yet go check it out give it a try there's literally zero commitment i'm not trying to scam anyone i just want everyone to stay signed up because the box is so awesome head over to backcountryfuelbox.com check it out you won't be disappointed get signed up if you want to be a part of the july box all right thanks guys All right, Ben. Welcome to Wapiti Wednesday. September calls. I love that hat, by the way. Where did you get? Is that whose hat is that? Um, so it was locally 
uh, Weston Paul started a brand. Okay. And he had like good altitude September calls. And then here in the last year, uh, Travis and Zach from Montana Wild kind of took over for him. Just, mm. you know, he was, Weston was, I think, busy with family and just didn't have, didn't was, have the time to put into it. And I was wondering if that was Zach and Trevor's or Zach and Travis's thing or mm-hmm. if it's uh, something else. No, it's, uh, yeah, they, they, they took over. Oh, it was nice. it was originally done by okay, Wes okay. and Paul. So I need that hat. I like that hat. That's They're good. Sweet. Yeah, <laughs> they got them. I just checked. I got a buddy that uh, had commented on it, and I'm gonna next time I go see him, I'm gonna bring him one. Nice. So I, I just wanted to make sure that they had inventory and they were gonna be available. Zach was out shooting the other day. He needs. To, I should have told him to bring me a hat. <laughs> there you go. It's crazy how many people are in Bozeman. Yeah, like, man. right. Yeah, uh, I podcast listeners probably get tired of hearing this, but I'm like, man, it's like we could do podcasts every week with someone in town. Like, yeah, <laughs> just about. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of swinging dicks in town when it comes to the hunting industry <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and I'm not one of them. I'm not proclaiming to be one. I'm just a guy that gets out there and gets after it. So Kills big bulls. I I try. Yeah. I try. So done pretty damn well. I've uh, I've been fortunate. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not like I just walk out there and and do it. It's it's a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of time spent. It's, uh, you know, I mean, I have, I've had a, you know, I've been asked by several new hunters, you know, what, what, it, what it takes. And I'm like, well, I think about 90% of the guys out there go out for the first time opening day or the day before opening day and they have a plan, but they have no clue yeah. what's there and what's, what's to be expected. And, uh, I've got a, a friend that just moved here, um, he's lived all over and he, he's, he hit me up with, uh, with that question and, and it's fresh in my head. I, I told him, I'm like, you know what? Hunting season is year round. It's just only certain days you can actually shoot the animal, yeah. you know? I mean, you're hunting for a game plan when the bell dings. And I think I, I compared it to like MMA fighting. Just as a like a weird yeah, yeah. example, these fighters don't just step in the ring and and throw down. You're talking like months of preparation. Hunting is the same thing. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see. You can see the dynamic between people who are next level, right? Like there's a there's a next step where it gets real serious, and then it's it's a big time commitment. That's a lot of it. It's like spending the time mm-hmm. constantly. When it becomes a year round thing, it changes it. Which is so tough because I know there's a lot of people that have, I mean, obviously hunting is amazing, but it's not the same priority as it is to you and I, where it's, this is all we think about, all we do. Yep. Um, and a lot of people even <clears throat> don't have it in their backyard. You know, one of the benefits of living in the mountains is you get in your backyard, it's right there. You can go anytime you want. Mm-hmm. It's kind of tough for everyone else. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I think if you can, if you can get to a good place that has good opportunity, Montana's pretty full by the way yeah um, Wyoming's yeah Wyoming nice. is awesome I've yeah. been thinking about moving to Idaho actually because <laughs> they've got you know you can buy two tags yeah, in two Idaho tags. two Everyone, tags man, that's I crazy. mean here you only get one so <laughs> um and that's actually where I've been spending most of my time is over in Idaho yeah so <laughs> yeah you're, you're the genius that lives in Montana and hunts in Idaho yeah <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my wife's a teacher and she's tenured. It's like, we don't want to uproot yeah. and move, move to Idaho. Um, you know, based on, on that, her family's here. We've got mm-hmm. Kyler. My, he just turned 19 months old. So did having a baby change your hunting? Um, I don't think last year it did. Cause he was pretty much just like you could set him down and he wasn't going anywhere. Uh. Um, so it was easy for my wife or me. To, to take care of him. He just had to make sure he was fed, changed, and yeah. had his naps, and he was comfortable. You know, now he's running around, throwing shit against the walls. <laughs> he's <laughs> screaming at things at random times. Like, he'll scare you. He'll be on the other side of the our living room, and you can't see him. He'll be behind the couch, and he'll just, this blood-curdling stream, and you walk over there, and then he starts giggling and, and like, pointing at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. So... <laughs> Um, but no, he's, it's last year. No. So to answer your question, no, it didn't. But, uh, my wife's actually kind of showed a little bit of interest to getting back in it. She's like, that's some arrows for me, you know? Oh. So, and I, 
I had a, you know, she's got a really nice bow, a Matthews of Ale that didn't see a lot of use because she was just so busy with Kyler. And now mm-hmm. she's, she's like on my to-do list is to, to fletch up some white get, arrows, get some, get some arrows going for her and stuff. And I'm like, I got the arrows. Let's, let's do this. Nice. So, <laughs> so what's your background? What's your story? Um, in terms of what, like I'm Scandinavian, Norwegian and look like a Viking, like yeah. that kind of background or. I was thinking less that far back, but maybe okay. that has a lot to do with why you're a great hunter. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, the short of it is, is I grew up in the Midwest, I loved fishing. My dad got me into like waterfowl hunting when I was a kid. Loved doing that. I mean, I have really fond memories of walking out on the national forest behind our cabin and, you know, jumping wood duck ponds. And that's when I... You know, you, you the first few times you, like, get that adrenaline rush from hunting. I remember vividly, like, getting into position and my dad was going to the other end of the wood duck pond, you know, and going to push all these ducks in there. It's like everywhere you looked, everywhere there was open water, there were wood ducks and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I was 12 or 13. I had a 20-gauge that I could, could, I mean, I stood it up next to me and it was yeah. almost as tall as me kind of stuff. That That's kind of what got me into hunting. And then I got into, you know, deer hunting. And, you know, when I, when I got into deer hunting in Minnesota, populations were down, there were some severe winters, you know, and winter kill was a, a pretty common thing when you had that. And so I think I went, I went four or five years from like 12 years old to like 15, 16 before I killed a deer. Like, <laughs> I sucked at hunting. It was, t- it was, that was terrible. Um, I was not patient. You know, it's all tree stand hunting, tree stand hunting. You, you know, deer camp, you walk out to the deer stand opening morning, you climb up, you know, you've maybe done some maintenance on this stand that you've pounded into the tree with nails, not like a hang on, yeah. like old school stuff. You wait for first light and you get there an hour ahead of time and you're, you hear little things and you're, imagination is going crazy yeah, yeah. and so that's <clears throat> that's kind of where my hunting started and I was never patient enough you know my dad was always like stay in your tree till nine o'clock you know or ten o'clock you know whatever it was and I would always be like walking up behind my dad's stand at like eight <laughs> seven thirty you know <laughs> and uh it was it was like I said it took me a long time to shoot my first year and that was that's like rifle hunting I mean <laughs> I'm not talking bow hunting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, that's kind of what, what got me into it. And, you know, I went through that. I continued to hunt. I strived for it. I actually got into bow hunting through some buddies in high school that would go run up and down these creeks in the spring. Like school would get out. We'd go to this spot and we'd chase fish with bow fishing equipment. Oh, really? I went and bought my first bow. I bought in a pawn shop. <laughs> A Hoyt Rebel, um, you know, round wheels, steel cables. Yeah, yeah. Um, that. But bow fishing was the first start of it? Bow fishing was my, my archery start, yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I can do this in the fall for big game, and I can start way earlier. And I remember the first deer that walked by my stand, I, I mean, from a preparation standpoint, I basically screwed some muzzies on the end of my arrow, and I'd been sighted in. Yeah. And uh, this little buck, year and a half old, like a four corn, walks by 20 yards, and I shoot over his back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I struggled a lot as a kid hunting, mm-hmm. but I pushed it a lot too. And I saw success from other people. It's so, like my dad was a good hunter, and so he killed stuff all the time. And I was always, I was always out by myself mm-hmm. trying to do it. And you know, and I was listening to you, and I'm like, man, I wonder if that has to do with those who are successful later in life. You know, what cultivates that drive, that next level? You know, we were talking about things being mm-hmm. that next level. And so I wonder what pushes that in some people and not in others. I mean, I think anybody that's competitive that, uh, you know, that has drive to be successful at something, if they're met with failure the first 20 times they try something, <laughs> they're either going to walk away from it and completely abandon it or they, they, they're going to work through it and they're going to they're gonna use that as motivation. Yeah, And, you know, I mean, I was athletic. I played multiple sports all through high school. I mean, you name it, I did it. I wrestled. I, so- I played soccer, baseball, 
I was on the swim team for a couple of years. You were on the swim team? I was, yeah. I did not see you as a swimmer. I'm, I grew up on a lake. My parents were teachers. You know, growing up in Minnesota, we had a cabin up in northern Minnesota. We lived in the suburbs of Minneapolis. School would get out in, like, early June, and it was like, get your stuff together. We're leaving for three months. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, yeah, say bye to all your friends. <laughs> and I hated it. I was really? like, I want to I go hang out with my buddy Josh and Nick and... And ride bikes around till midnight and do dumb stuff, you know. They, you know, all the hood rat things with hood rat fans. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. uh, it, I mean, it kept me out of trouble yeah. for sure. Because I mean, I still managed to get in trouble. <laughs> um, I mean, up up at my cabin uh, with my parents, but uh, I say my cabin, but it's. Uh, I mean, I was I had a fourteen foot fishing boat that I had free reign of, and then I got to get a job at some tourist attraction, you know. Yeah. In Walker, Minnesota. And uh, for a while, I worked at a, like a go-kart track <laughs> that did go, had a, like a, they started with a dirt track and like, like side-by-side two-seat go-karts, yeah. like, and the track would just get rallied and I was like replacing spindles on Dude, that stuff. sounds epic. It was fun. Um, and then the guy that owned it was like, screw this, we're not making any money, I'm going to pave it. So we paved it. He paved it. We put like tires with like strips of like steel all the mm-hmm. way around the track kind of as the buffer and then he got all these little fiberglass go-kart cars that would go like 45 i mean all all short of like drifting around the track and i remember the owner would show up when i was getting ready to close you know with all his buddies like six trucks would roll in <laughs> bunch of beer and you know i'm like 16 17 and he's like we got it ben get out of here i'm like okay <laughs> so that's but, really cool yeah so i mean that was that was kind of my that was my upbringing you know um i went to school in the suburbs you know with a huge graduating class i graduated with like 900 kids really and then i spent all summer and my best friend was billy the bass that had a bed off the end of my dock <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> but I, I mean i look back on it now and it's like man i wish i could do that now i yeah, wouldn't, no I wouldn't change it for the world yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> no kidding. But at the time you're like so pissed that your parents drug you up there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we should go back. I want to get into, you know, getting into elk hunting stuff, but I guess I'd be reminisce if I didn't tell a story of our first, how we met. Sure. Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> so Ben and I had met, we would chatted a few times just through friends of friends and whatnot. Yeah. I think we, we had each other's number. You moved to town and yeah. we talked about trying to get together. And I mean, you're as busy as I am with stuff yeah. and it, it just didn't happen. And then I got the SOS call one night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm debating on whether it should, it should come from you or come from me. <laughs> it came from you. Cause no, I was, I mean the story, you should tell your, no, your, no. your version. <laughs> well, okay. Um, I could, I could, I could, I don't know. I'll tell it. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting around at my house. I just got finished doing something. I think it, what, it was late. It was like, it was after dark. And I got a, I got a text from a mutual friend that we have. And, and he was like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sitting in my house. It's like, Cody Rich is stuck in his truck. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? And I had your number because we'd been like texting a little yeah. bit back and forth. So I just, I called him, I called Cody and I, and I was like, Hey, we're doing a little pickle up there or wherever. I didn't even know where you were. And I was like, well, where are you? And, uh, I think you sent me your, your pin on Onyx yeah. or something yeah, like that. You know, Onyx, man. Yeah. And I was like, Oh shit. He's, <laughs> he's, he's like I'm deep. He's 90 deep. miles north of town. <laughs> Not just like out of town, like no. way out of like town. Like an hour and a half out of town. And it's it's like almost 10 p.m., I think. And I'm like, well. And I had, I think, Chester Floyd and Mike Parenti, mm-hmm. who works with uh, Newberg. Yeah. Um, we I just got done hanging out with them. And I was like, you boys, you want to go for a ride? <laughs> and uh, we jumped in my kind of my mountain rig, my mountain truck. And uh just bombed. gassed up. We, I mean, it, it was like I had to, I grabbed a, um, a few, you know, snatch straps and, uh, a snatch block. So if I needed to, you know, needed that and all the supplies that I had for, uh, recovery for, mission for, for recovery. And I didn't know what kind of vehicle you were in or anything. I might've asked, but I, I don't remember recall you like thinking, Oh, I'm like, Oh, it's a full size 
diesel truck. I'm like, I'm screwed. I got this 1987 Forerunner <laughs> that's uh, that's built pretty pretty solid. The funny thing about that situation is like, it's kind of a, it's not necessarily a Tuesday, but back home, you know, you always have buddies or someone, and so. I think it was one evening, I was like, hey, Kelsey, let's go for a drive about. And end up going on a drive about, you know how it is, end up 100 miles away from home. Who knows where you're going to be? Yo. And I was like, this road looks fun. Or it wasn't even fun. It was like, I had literally not gone up a couple different roads because there's snow drifts and still. And this was this spring when I just started to thaw out. And going up this road, everything's dry, fine, great, looking good. And and then I hit just a little bit of snow and a little bit of mud. It must have been a wet spot. And it was it was really nothing like spun a little bit but not bad and then i was like oh no big deal like fix this ended up monkey jacking around with that truck and the problem was like whether i was going forward or backwards she started sliding towards that cliff all the time and you just kept getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer i mean i'd i got nothing to dig with i got i am zero prepared like no toe strap no shovel no nothing so i'm like digging out with a flat rock and trying to like place rocks and like getting every time i know i only got so many times before i get too close to the edge to try to just walk it out of there and just monkeyed around for probably two hours or so before she just got too close to the edge and i'm like if it's either do it at a hundred and hope for the best or, or we're going to do nothing. It's here. either a big win or a big fail. Yeah. So you're kind of at that point. <laughs> so and I was like, man, who am I going to call with a winch? So I hit up Andrew and then I remembered Ben. I was like, Oh yeah, Ben's got wheel and gear. Yep. So Ben came to rescue. So I'm sitting there at midnight and Ben shows up. I was pretty happy to see you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Kelsey was even more happy. Yeah. To see you. <laughs> I think, I think she had said that you guys had like, what were you watching, Game of Thrones or something like that on, like, an iPad or listening to oh, she, the book oh, yeah, or something? yeah, She was listening to that book, uh, the Game of Thrones book. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty so, funny. So that's how we first met, in the woods, rightfully so, yep. midnight. <clears throat> I think we, to get me out. we got home at, like, 2 a.m. Yeah. I'm so, freaking late. <laughs> definitely. And, uh, yeah, so there it is. There's the story of... How we met. Yep. So when you get into elk hunting, I mean, when, when did that kind of start? Um... So I, I, uh, you know, after I, you know, back to where we were with me and the deer hunting thing. So I got a wild hare. I was, you know, running a, an archery shop to start hunting other species just cause there isn't the opportunity in mm-hmm. Minnesota for, you just have tree stands, tree stands for deer. You know, I didn't have any farm permission or agriculture to get on or anything like that. It was all big woods. And I started looking into North Dakota mule deer. I read, you know, now this is kind of cliche, but Cameron Haynes book when he, right after he wrote it, that, uh, backcountry one. Yep. I read that book and I was like, dude, I got to do this. Yeah, yeah. And then fell in love with Western North Dakota out in the badlands chasing, you know, mule deer and, you know, coming from where I'm at, I'm shooting at a year and a half old anytime I have a chance Yeah, yeah. in Northern Minnesota to, like a two-year-old mule deer is like, oh my god, that thing is huge! You know, it's like a, it's a three by two, and it's got crab claw yeah. split on the top, and uh, so I got into that, and then it was every year, every year I I went out there and I loved it, and I'd get to like Fargo for like a three D shoot or something because I used to shoot pretty competitively archery, and uh, I get to Fargo and I just get giddy, you know. I'm like, oh my god, I'm like five hours away from mule deer country, you know. I'm like. I got to find a way to, to do this more often or be able to go out more. And, yeah. um, the, the company I was working with at the time, you know, I was with them for like three or four years, sportsman's warehouse. Okay. And, uh, I'd done a bunch of store sets for guys, you know, you know, our district managers and, you know, done some training of other archery technicians and stuff like that. And they're popping up stores all over the place, Colorado, you know, they're doing six to you know, seven, eight, nine stores a year. And I'm like, I think I want to move out West somewhere. And, uh, I wanted to move to Bozeman. Well, I, I shouldn't say I wanted to, I wanted to move out West. I didn't, I didn't, I'd never been to Bozeman and I was looking at like Colorado Springs as a, as an option. Boulder, I think maybe. And I, uh, 
I was kind of at the point where I was going to put in, and then I, I, I ran into a guy at ATA because I was working with Vapor Trail Archery at the time, tying strings on the side. And uh, one of the guys from the Missoula Sportsman's Warehouse I met, he was out there with a different brand, and he was like, hey, yeah, that Bozeman store, that, that just opened back up for the position that you could apply for. And apparently with Bozeman, it took forever to get stuff through city commission and stuff, and it took an extra two years of planning to you know, before they were approved to, to build their, their building. And in that time frame, the guy that was originally slated to take that spot was like, you know, I'm out, I'm doing something else. So that spot came open and I called the regional manager and I said, Hey, is this, is this really open? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. So then I called my other regional manager and said, Hey, would you recommend me for this position with, Mm -hmm. you know, the head guys? And he's like, absolutely. Yeah. So I called I wrote like a little request and said, Hey, I'd, I'm interested in transferring to this store. You know, I have uh, my regionals grace, you know, and endorsement in doing this. And I got a call back like a week later. I'm like, all right, this is what we're going to pay you. This is what we're going to do. You got 24 hours to decide, you know, call me back. And, and it was like, like it hit me at that point in time. It's real. Yeah. All <clears throat> of a sudden it's like, I'm like, holy crap, you know, this is, this is an opportunity. So I I think I called him back in like four hours. (laughs) It was like, I'll give it a little time. (laughs) And I'm like, I'll take it, you know, sign me up, put my name down, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, like a year later, they had a big going away party for me at the store. You know, a bunch of people, a lot of customers showed up. A lot of my customers that became friends showed up and here I am. I was the only one that moved to Montana in that store to tell you how hardcore I was into the hunting part of it that applied for a non-resident tag and was drawn. So all the other management (laughs) didn't have tags. (laughs) Like the store manager didn't have any tags, you know, and I put in and I was lucky enough to draw a non-resident general archery tag in in Montana. And, uh, this was in 2007. So you just jacked you elk hunting for the first time. Yeah. I, I like, I got on my, you know, on my maps on Google earth. And I was like, I want to hunt here. And I'm looking at areas that are like 20 miles back from the trail. I just like not even <laughs> thinking. And then, I, and then, um, I was looking up in another area and I get out here and I start like reading regulations and I'm like, Oh, there's a backcountry rifle hunt in that area that starts September 15th. So I'm like, I'm going to go in there with a bow. Yeah. And the other area was like one of the hardest units in the whole state to draw. <laughs> so all, all this preparation, I like had all these pins on Google earth. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And then not to mention, I hiked the first hill when I got out here and I, I, I don't know, I gained 500 vertical feet and went a half a mile and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so my, my plans definitely changed, but in that first season out here with a, with a non-resident tag, I was able to kill my first bull. Really? Yeah. How did that happen? Um, it was a cluster. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, get some insight from some local guys. Yeah. Say, hey, yeah, go, go try in there. That's, that's a good area. Ended up, you know, I had my Badlands 2200 pack, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> Danner boots, you know, yeah. I mean, just... Like, wow, I I was doing that type of hunting with that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's good stuff, but, you know, man, his gear come a long ways, and, and there's a lot, a lot better options now. But got to the trailhead, planned on doing just a day hunt, hiked back, got to the trailhead at like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., something like that, hiked back, got about three miles up the trail, got into some bugle and elk right at sunrise, um, nothing really happening. What was your reaction? First bugles. I don't know if that was the first bugles you ever heard, but like when you first heard a bugle in the woods, it wasn't, it wasn't my first bugle. Cause I, I had actually had a, some previous bugle action. I actually, I called a bull in like clear across a Canyon over a thousand yards away from me, screaming his head off the whole way in. And I hit him up in the back strap Ugh. at like 35 yards. Um, like the week before I killed this bull. So not, not only did I have, um, kill one bull, but I had two opportunities and he was a big five. He was like, you know, not like a rag five, but like 
those big fives that have a big like split yeah. whale tail at the top. Um, what was your reaction? And first bull, you screaming all the way into you. You get a shot. You used to on cloud nine. Like I'm never not having. It turned into a big pile of <laughs> <laughs> literally like. I mean, it's like a. I I I remember the first few times I saw elk, and it was like. It's, it, they're like horses with horns running through the woods. They're huge, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm used to dealing with you know, 130 pound deer and stuff <laughs> out of a tree stand. They look even smaller when they're down below you, yeah. and you're like at eye level with these these giant animals. And it's like, wow. No, I I remember it was it was crazy. And that the the scenario for killing this bull, I mean. It was, it was, like I said, a cluster. It was a shit show. It was, we got all the way back there. Uh, we, we got into elk three miles and they're like, oh, let's just keep walking. And I'm like, I had an, a goal and let's just say I had no, I didn't know how to really relatively general as how I, far something was back. <laughs> yeah. So we hiked till noon, <laughs> kept going in and we got to the trailhead before light and we got in there at noon and we got up onto the backside. We probably gained 3,000 vertical feet over like seven miles. <laughs> um, and it's like the only idiots that hunt back here have horses. <laughs> and um, we get all the way back. And then it's like, okay, that midday nap, you know, siesta time. So we, we, we took like a two-hour nap. We're getting up. We're getting ready to kind of head back. It's like three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And then bull sounds off like down into this hole after we've climbed all day and are at the top and it's like at the bottom yeah <laughs> well and it wasn't i mean it was probably four or five hundred vertical feet but it was all dark timber like mm -hmm. thick dark timber and uh you know the guy i was with was one of the other managers at the store he was actually the store manager and um he's like eh, let's go try you know what we got to lose we got all the way up here not thinking at all like what would happen if we actually killed something <laughs> um we we worked down and it, we got into a frenzy. It was one of those bull frenzies where there was probably three or four bulls, maybe two groups of cows that had kind of intertwined, and then all all hell breaks loose and they oh, just yeah. scream fast. Rut and fast. So you got into a rut fast and had a bull screaming coming all the way in your first year of elk hunting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's no wonder you're uh, hooked on I, elk hunting. I'm hooked on it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, no. So we we got down in there. You know, the guy was with hung back and just bugled. He had a little power bugle, Primos, you know, with the blue reeds. Mm -hmm. And he was probably 75 to 100 yards. And meantime, I get in and then I'm like, boom, cow, cow. And I'm in woods that you can't see 60 yards in. You know, it's thick north face. Mm -hmm. And then flash of horns. But, you know, another bull over here. And in this one set, I had three bulls come in. I I mean, they all look like giant mythical creatures with horns, you know, like horse sized animals. Horses. Yeah. Um and I had a cow come by me at like less than ten yards and like totally give me like the try to catch me moving, giving me the head nod and like mm. I'm gonna look away but no I'm not, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no, I'm, I'm like look over here. Oh, oh, God, yeah. Um you know, when when they get so close they can make you flinch yeah. when they snap their neck. And the bull I killed raked a tree down the hill, probably 40 yards from me for during this whole story, how this whole thing kind of unfolded. Mm -hmm. There's a bull on a tree through a patch of brush. And knowing what I know now, I would have moved into a position to shoot right off the bat. But there yeah. were elk coming from every direction. And, um, you know, one of the bulls was at less than 20. Uh, another bull was probably at about 40, you know. And then with the cows and everything, and then I'm like, okay. And I'm like ranging everything with uh, with my range finder all over the place and trying to get a fix. I'm like, he's going to come because my buddy's back behind me bugling, bugling his head off. And uh, he's getting him all riled up. And sure enough, as soon as he was done raking that tree, he just started kind of side hilling away. And I found an opening where I could see basically the vitals. And I had, I had ranged that stuff. It was like 44 yards. And was able to cut the shot and he ran down the hill and I 
you know, went back up, got the, the hunting partner I was with at the time and walked down and we started, I mean, just like little Christmas trees, just drenched with like foamy, frothy yeah. blood, like good lung hit. So, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, it's good. Yeah. And then we ended up starting to follow him after a little while. Now it's like 6 p.m. Oh, God. And we follow him. It was a low hit. And my experience now with low hits is that they die, but it takes them a little longer than if you like center punch that lung. You know, you hit a, a lower ventricle in the lung, it deflates the lung, but there's still some function there because it's not filled up. And uh, we ended up bumping him mm. out of a bed. And now he's gone probably a quarter mile. And Away from the trailhead. Oh, yep. Up, <laughs> up mountain. We've, we've hit the bottom of this straw uh, and up the other side. further. And now we start to get into some broken meadows and stuff like that. And the last spot that we bumped him was right on the edge of one of these meadows. And he, he angled across this meadow that was probably 400 yards wide. We could get a little speck of blood about every 10, uh, 10 or 15 yards. So I'm starting to like kind of like deflate. I'm like, so my first season, this is like this, the second elk that I've hit. The first one I know is fine yeah. because I waited a half an hour and then I walked down the hill and he was, he was so fired up. The first bull that I hit in the back strap, he went down the hill about a hundred yards and stayed there for a half an hour while I waited <laughs> thinking that, Oh, he's, he's going to die. It was a high hit, but it was downhill and yeah. talking yourself into it. Yeah. You know, just be positive. And <laughs> I get down there and where he was standing, there was a, a like a, you know, like a small, plate size rock flat rock that had a spot on it with maybe like 20 little drips and that was it and there was no drips on the other side it was just on the one side and i walk over the hill he barks at me a half an hour after i hit him and runs down the hill oh, and i'm yeah. like yeah he was fine yeah so he 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 had he was so fired up by the calling that he he just he wanted to wait it out you know, elk are, yeah. elk are patient, man. Elk, elk will wait forever. If, they, if they're convinced something is there, it's like when a deer busts you in a tree stand. They'll sit there oh, yeah. and stare at you for 20 minutes. Yeah, you've seen deer stare at a tree limb for an hour and a half. You're like, man, that's a yep. patient deer. So <laughs> Anyway, back to the story. Yeah, so that was the first bull. Now the second bull, this one that we're tracking, yeah. we've, we've bumped him once. And, and again, I'm, I know I'm basically on, you know, this is uncharted territory for me. I have no idea how tough elk are, you know. I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I don't know what to think, you know, an experienced bow hunter guy with elk. With zero confidence. Cause you already lost. Yeah. One. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I, we get down, we finally kind of get a heading on this bull. We kind of mark the direction and figure he's running. He's going to run in a straight line. He's not going to like zigzag or anything across this meadow. And we, we get a bearing on the other side of this meadow and we walk over there. And then when I get to the other side, you hit this uphill about 30 yards, real steep. And it's one of those four feet wide. It looks like somebody has been running livestock through there. Yeah. One of those trails on those steep hills. It's black. Yeah. And he's laying right at the top of that hill. Oh, really? Like in a bed. Didn't, didn't make it up. Didn't, and couldn't get up. Yeah. He had bled out. I mean, we'd, we'd fought, I mean, great blood the entire way. And then after that last bump, he made it across that meadow, ran out of gas. And I walk up there and... He's like kind of throwing his head. And it's, it's, this is the one of the shitty parts about hunting. If you ever have to finish an animal like that or something. And I just started knocking arrows and, you know, getting in position. And, you know, I, I think I shot him twice more right through the lungs both times. And, you know, he was dead mm -hmm. where he was. I could have walked away and he, he would have expired. But yeah. you hate to see an animal suffer like that. And that was my first elk. It was a... Uh, Brutal. Yeah. Brutal. And uh, at that point, I think if you take into account the routes, it was nine miles from the trailhead oh. on a day hunt. So you learned a little bit about where you shoot elk <laughs> yeah. on your first yeah. trip. That, that was still to this day the furthest I've ever gone <laughs> <in> for elk. <laughs> so um, looking back, I mean, super successful now, but <clears throat> what advice do you think you'd give yourself in first year? Um. Scout. I mean, that's that's how I I find success now. I feel like is it's not an opening day yeah. whistle. You don't start opening day. You you know the tree that that elk's going to walk by opening day, 
and without being in the field beforehand, you're not going to, you're not going to know that, um, you know, knowing elk behavior, they're, they're very habit oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, they have their places they like to be. They have their like, they have their places that they like to, uh, go when they're bumped. And, you know, sometimes they run like a routine and it's, it's, it's all about the, the days spent before. So I it's mean, just being in elk country. Like you said, you know, a lot of early years spent following elk yep. versus knowing mm-hmm. where they're going to be. And it's like, you're like, oh, there's an elk. And especially, you know, first daylight, I want to find some elk or I got these elk. They're right here. Yep. And then you follow them all the way to their bed and then end up bumping them because they shut up. And, oh man, you spend a lot of years just following elk mm-hmm. for no reason. I mean, you, that's how you learn elk behavior, exactly. I guess, <laughs> you know, like exactly. oh, that's what not to do, but. That's definitely, I could see that. Mm-hmm. That's something, even for me. Is. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, now, I mean, I look at it totally different. I mean, I, I like to hunt. I like to get my time in before, mm-hmm. you know, when there's nobody out there. But then there's all those uncontrollables, too, that, you know, all summer I've been watching this group of bulls on the same, in the same basin do the same thing. Opening day. All of a sudden, there's two trucks on that ridge. There's one on this ridge, and who knows how many yahoos are in this basin? Yeah, you know. How do you cope with that? And another problem with scouting for elk that people will find is you could. It's not like mule deer where opening day that buck's probably going to still be in the high country. Mm -hmm. You know, with elk, as soon as they go hard horned, it could be day of season, could be day before season. Things change. Absolutely, wind blows in the in the fall and. All yep. of a sudden, everything changes. How do you deal with that, with, like, scouting and knowing, you know, these elk? Is it just a matter of knowing it well enough to know this is what they're going to do when they do that? Well, I mean, it's, you know, the the number one thing that you're, you're looking for come mating season mm-hmm. for bulls is cows. Yeah. And cows run a, a, a fairly tight routine. They're they're more 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 predictable. More habitual. Yep, than than what you typically find the bulls to be. You know, the bulls are going to be real easy in July and August, but I know a lot of guys that find big bulls in July and August, and then come fall. No, I do. Yeah, 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 they don't. I mean, we start hunting most most western states start hunting either late August or early September, and by that time they've been hard horned for two weeks, and you know you see mill deer go through the same transition. They go hard horn, and within a week maybe two of hard horn and they're off that pattern. They change their, their hormones are changing, you know, from a biology standpoint, their priorities in their mind aren't, you know, evade predators, eat, sleep and get fat. You know, it's okay. Now I got to like prove that I'm the the king of the mountain, you know, and elk, elk do this. And the thing is with our mule deer, I feel like they shed their velvet a couple weeks later and the, the, the seasons coincide mm-hmm. mule deer elk seasons typically are very similar in most states and with that extra two weeks like if we started in the western states if we started mid-august for elk you could some you could kill them in summer pattern yeah really easy yeah. but white tails you know the guys that are hunting agriculture in the midwest and stuff see the same thing yeah you know when the, when the when the deer shed their velvet when it comes to the scouting stuff, when you do you look for cows or do you look for bulls? Or do you look for both? I look for both. Um, both are a win in my book. Um, the you know if, if you if you find bulls, obviously that's great. It gives you a, a good idea of the age structure of the herd. Um, if you find cows, that's great because those cows are going to be there in early September. You know if they're in, they're in a summer pattern, that summer pattern goes till you know, mid September when you start getting those cooler nights and, you know, you start seeing potential snow and high country and stuff like that. That's, that's what throws those cows into different patterns. And with, with bulls, the the biggest bulls typically are going to travel, you know, as little as possible to maintain their, you know, their, their strength mm-hmm. and their, their fat reserves to breed. So you're, a lot of times you're, your younger bulls are going to travel further. So if you find a, a basin that's adjacent to a basin of bulls, adjacent to a, a basin of cows, chances are, that's right, you know, yeah, in, yeah. in what I find, the, the bigger bulls are going to take over those herds of cows that are close. 
let's just walk through some basic stuff just for everyone else. I want to say I go up on the mountain right now and you know, I'm in a new state. So I go up here and I'm like, I want, I've never hunted here. Like I want to go just see what's up. And I go out there and I find some cows. What's, what would be your next move? Like what's your next step? Well, there's elk there. Yeah. That's, that's the most important thing. Um, the next step for me would be to, uh, check, you know, cause the cows through the summer, they're raising, you know, young mm -hmm. and they're not going to be in as nasty of a draw that maybe a bull, a mature bull or a, a bachelor group of bulls is going to want to be in, you know, bulls are typically they winter higher than the, the herds of cows. Just like, you know, you, 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 when you see winter grounds, the bulls are up in the, in the trees mm -hmm. still, and the cows are down in the flats and it's the same thing in the summer. So I'm looking at adjacent basins, maybe the same basin, um, maybe in some of the nastier terrain, you know, how far away would you look? I, I would look in the same basin. I would look at, you know, maybe some of, if there's avalanche shoots at the top, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, spots. Um, I've really relied heavily on glassing probably the last five or six years because it, it's non-intrusive, you get a good idea, and with good glass, you can you can really tell what an area is going to produce. Mm. You know, the bachelor group that comes out. You know, the biggest bulls might not be as visible as the smaller bulls, but if you're seeing 280, 300 class, six points on the regular in a, in a bachelor group, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that there's probably a, a, a big bull in uh, there. That's, that's really good advice. I don't think it's ever been said on the podcast, but if you find – You'll see areas that have, you know, bachelor groups are all like little 240, 250 bulls. Mm -hmm. You get pretty good assumption that, you know, there's going to be a little bit bigger, but it's not yeah. like you're going to go 150 inches bigger. Yeah. You know, maybe yep. one, but, you know, like you said, like if you're in an area and you're looking at bachelor groups that are that 300 size, mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah, you're that, a good and area. that's the thing. If they're hanging out in the open, I mean, typically that's a, that's a younger age class bull yep. before they... Before they go like in, in visible, yeah. you know, you know, like, you know, and, and horned ungulates are all very similar. You know, they, they're all going to, the, you hit these big, big elk, big deer, muleys, whitetail, it doesn't matter. They hit a point where they're the most sensitive to pressure. They're, they're the most sensitive to daylight movement, things like that. And then as they get older, I feel like they start to get lazy about it. Maybe they're more visible and things like that. You see it. You see it with guys that are targeting the same buck that lives in the same, you know, you know, draw in a, on an Iowa farm that all can kind of translate. I mean, it's just animal, you know, behavior. It's, yeah. it's, it does seem like there's like a middle ground where, you know, a bull gets to a certain age and he gets very reclusive and, mm -hmm. and, and then as he gets older, he almost falls into those lazy routines. Yep. You know, and that's when they get killed. It's like your bull gets into that lazy routine where he starts doing the same thing every year, same spot every year. Yep. And it just depends on if someone finds him or not. But. Yeah. Exactly. So when it comes to that kind of scouting, we'll go back and talk a little bit. I mean, you find a cows, let's go look for, for bulls. Uh, how is that different? How do you use, you know, optic scouting and, and spending time behind the glass to find big bulls? You know, um, vantage, finding a, a high glassing vantage is huge. You know, the higher, the better. The, the other thing that I feel like is, is utilized fairly well, if you can't, I mean, if you're hunting in an area that's primarily timber, cameras, your best friend, mm -hmm. you know, get something that's got a long battery life because you want to be, you want to have your cameras out. I put my cameras out in like June, all new batteries. They're, they're good. You know, yeah. in the warmer months for up to a year in some cases, you know, is what the, that's what the manufacturer says. Yeah. I mean, you never know if it's, if it's going to happen. And then the, the problem is, is if you get one of those, those little dancing <laughs> leaf phantoms in front of your camera <laughs> and you get back and you got to go through 3000 pictures of nothing yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a few animals here and there. But so I've, I've, I use cameras you know, and once I kind of get a figure on an area, I'll, I'll put cameras in early and I'll leave them and I'll go back and I'll move them right before velvet drops. So like mid August, and then I'll put them on wallows. So right now they're in pinch points, travel corridors, bedding really? areas. And, and that gives me an idea of resident elk. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a water source or a, 
um, you know, a, a particular food source or yeah. a bedding area, like a bench or a, a but in Montana. That seems like such big country. It'd be hard to like it is. pinch points or mm-hmm. food sources. Even it's, they're not, I mean, when you, when you walk around in the elk woods, you'll, you, I mean, you'll, you'd know, I mean, if, while you're hunting, when you, when you find that trail that connects two benches on a North face, mm-hmm. that's like your pinch point. And you'll see those trails. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just time in the woods, spending that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you didn't, <clears throat> new area then, and that's all great information. I'm not downplaying it out, but if you go to a new area, um, somewhere you haven't spent a lot of time, what's your scout look like for that? For, you know, you're looking for big bulls, obviously. Um, my mornings and evenings in a, in a new area, you know, and I'm, I'm always looking for new areas. I'm always trying to find new pockets that maybe haven't been disturbed by mm-hmm. hunters, something that's been overlooked. Again, it's going to be glassing. Mornings and evenings, you know, these animals are crepuscular, so their 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 time of movement is is you know low light periods and at night. So they're they're not going to be out in the heat of the day moving around. Typically, um, on occasion they will be, but it's not normal. And then during the day, if I want to look through uh, an area that I feel like is an area I want to I want to have had eyes on. Um, I'll, I'll walk during the day, try to stay in the timber. You know, that's where you find those little, little benches that aren't aren't on a map. Those little bedding spots where, you know, 10 to 20 cows can be in something that, you know, that's 60 foot by a hundred foot on a, on a, on a hillside. It's flat. You know, it almost seems like they carve beds out and like, they've been the same beds for years. Yeah, exactly. And you'll know, as soon as you get in a nice North facing timber slope, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, this is an elk cave. Do you ever worry about bumping elk though in the summer? Um, I do, but I feel like, you know, it's on time frame really. Yeah. I mean, I I don't, it's not, I don't. Yeah. Right now, like today is the third of July and if I bump something now, no, I'm not worried about it because it's going to, it's going to leave some scent. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, they're going to bump out of the area through their, yeah, through their escape route that they have planned. And then they're going to, within a week though, you know, or even later that day or tomorrow, they might be yeah. back in that spot. Now in uh, like August, like mid August, when I'm going in there, like I'll try to view an area and make sure that there isn't a big group of elk in there before I go in, either with a morning sit or an evening sit. And, you know, I, I hate bumping animals. And, and I've found that, you know, hunting antelope, hunting deer, when it comes to spot and stock, it really has sharpened my skills for elk. Um, when I look at a scenario, I'm like, I'm only going in on something. I'm like 80 to 90% positive I'll have a shot opportunity. Oh, that's so crucial. Um, especially with these big animals, you know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to drop in, you know, and that's, it's, 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 it's about time spent too. I mean, I, I put myself in a position that I can spend a lot of time in the field come September as much as I can, as much as much time as I can afford with my job, my family, everything. And, uh, being able to say no, because I know it's not going to work mm-hmm. out. Just waiting is, for that right opportunity. Yep, it's so, so big. So, so big. especially if you're in an area and you Fairly confident the bull's not going to get bumped anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, man, just waiting for that right moment. Yep. Crucial. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, we were talking about scouting. Um, actually going out this weekend, I'm going to hang some cameras. <clears throat> now you got to be second guess myself because I'm going to hang them on wallows, mm-hmm. <laughs> even though it's early. Yep. Uh, but I don't think, I don't know that I'll get back in. I don't know. We'll see. I might, there's a couple of water holes I want to, you know, head yeah. up to. But uh, I mean, a water source is, is what a wallow is before fall. That's I mean, true. if it's isolated, if there isn't like a creek running down next to it, or mm. if you know you're not going to be in until after they've they've been hitting these wallows. And one of them is actually, I mean, there's a wallows in there, but I really like those <clears throat> springs that are sucked up into a, a nice straw that's, you know, mm-hmm. in that dark timber. If you yep. can find a spring that's in dark timber, you know, on those hundred degree days, that's where those yeah. are going to be. Like, it's just, it's... It's, North face, not be. not a spot of yep. sunlight hitting the ground, yep. cool ground. Yep. Yeah. And so I spent a little time doing that. But, um, you know, the other thing I want to check is benches. I'm huge on benches. And this comes from being a Roosevelt hunter because some stupid Roosevelt will sit on a bench their entire life. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always looking for benches or even ridges, benches in ridges, to where if I got a finger ridge, 
I can go and not mess with the timber patch. I'll work that finger ridge and check that bench in that ridge. And if it's got rubs, that tells me way more than anything else. Because mm-hmm. if they're rubbing, that means he's going to be there in September. He may be down in that dark timber below me, but I'm not going to go down there. Because I don't want to bump him. So, and there's probably a herd of elk down there. If it's a good dark timber patch, like you said. So, like, you can be on top, check the rub lines. And then and they just, they, I mean, they rub pretty consistently in certain areas. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of marking their territory. Yep. Going in and out of a place. And that'll, that's kind of how I use it. And you can tell, you know, you know it is. You see a, a pile of freaking rubs. Oh, and, yeah. And you can just tell that's where they're going to be. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, get out, scout now. Find those those pockets, and if you've if you've spent, you know, one walk through in that area, make mental note of where those spots are. Mm-hmm. When you're back on that same hillside or in an, in an area adjacent to that, where you could hear a bugle, mm-hmm. a lot of times you'll hear a bugle come. You'd be like, I know where they are. They're on that bench that I I, I saw. <sighs> And, and that's it doubles even more when you're to you get that bull bugling and you know where that trail is. He's going to take that trail back up to you. So you pipe off here and you hear that bugle down there and you remember where there's a certain trail. Not only a is it going to get you access through a certain patch way better. That is absolutely crucial. And but you know where he's going to be coming back up through. And so you can kind of make maneuvers based on that. And like memorizing trail systems. So important. Absolutely. Yeah. So important. So it, it's what you have a GPS for, yeah. and that's gonna that's gonna help you out in those situations. And all you gotta do if you if you go through and you map that that main trail that connects maybe bench to bench and um, and whatnot, you'll know I need to drop down two hundred vertical feet, and then I can make all the noise I want to and get ahead of him. You know, if he's moving in a given direction. Yep. Yeah, or if he's going up, and you're like, okay, this is probably the trail he's on. I can slip over here and mm-hmm. do this. The uh, tip I'll give to a lot of people though, because say if you know there's a trail that he's probably going to come up on, don't set up on the trail because you're going to end up with a ten yard frontal, and that's well, about you it. You got to get through all the cows first. <laughs> you know, if he's got twenty cows, yeah. I mean that lead cow comes. Yeah, you know. she's looking at you like yeah. she's like, got you picked out in a half second. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the that's Unless always you wear an set. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Um, I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, no, it's exactly right. You know, you, you know, the, the cases where I've been, been able to reposition and get in front of, you know, a herd that, that first cow that comes through that she's, she's a, that lead cow. I mean, you get, you get past that and all the other ones like, aren't like, mm-hmm. oh, I wonder what I'm going to eat next. Uh, <laughs> you know, that first cow is like, uh, that bush looks like a bear. What is that? You know, <laughs> They're constantly, they got the radar going like crazy. Yeah. Um, I think I saw that stick move, Ooh, yeah. you know, Just breathe. Exactly. So, and that's, I mean, the bull, the bull I killed in Idaho in 17, um, it was that kind of a situation. They, they, they ended up coming up. I was above them on the hill. That the, the first two cows were both like on, like nervous. They were on pins and needles. And then the rest of them were like, you know they were all on the same trail cause it was so steep, but it was, it was like they were playing tag and screwing yeah. off and, yeah. and then behind them all was the bull. And, you know, I waited till I remember distinctly waiting for those two cows to pass and get completely around the hill and out of sight. And then I ranged one of the other yeah. ones cause they, they weren't no, that's they, smart. Those so lead cows, man, those pick you off mm-hmm. no time. Uh, do you spend more time calling or what's, I call. I, I do. I like to call. I, uh, I, I'm pretty, I, I kind of, my hunting is kind of adaptive based on the scenario. Um, if I'm in a, an area where it's, there's a, there's a lot of people calling, there's a lot of hunting pressure. I'll, I'll kind of, you know, put the call away a little more, but you know, I mean, when you, the, it seems like the closer to the trailheads you are, or maybe the more to improved like drivable roads, you get, everybody's out there blowing on a call. Um, I've called in a lot of elk. I've killed a lot of elk calling them in, but you know, depending on the scenario, I mean, I, I, I will put it away. I always have calls with me. It's not like I go out in the woods without calls. Mm-hmm. And I like to kind of, I like to kind of rouse to a, a, a group of elk, a bull, you know, I like to challenge a bull from a distance, you mm-hmm. know, maybe do some locate bugles and then just, you know, piss him off and match him bugle oh, yeah. for bugle and then let him start getting his cows up and, you know, moving. And then once he's heading in a given direction, provided my scouting is, 
is in check for that area. And I can kind of put a direction on where he's going, maybe the direction his bugle sounds like he's headed or if he's heading up basin or down basin or upside hill or whatever, I can use that. And I can, knowing where his move is going to take him and beating him there, you know, because I'm in such awesome shape is just just the way to do it. Yeah, just run. (laughs) When it comes to big bulls, I mean, that big bull that you killed with your tribe, did you you call that bull in or? No, I did not. That bull, um, I had him aged. He was, uh, he was 11. Really? Yeah. Um, I killed two other bulls in that area um, in previous years. One was eight and one was nine. And that bull was, was 11. And he was, I mean, I was after that bull for two years. I'd hunted him exclusively for one year. But I had another big six point come in and I was like, I don't care. I'm going to shoot this one. Yeah. You know, kind of one of those things. But that was that was a scenario. That bull. Well, you gotta tell the story of like taking your treadmill that day. Okay. So, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Well, it's a, so I I had this bull targeted. Yeah. Pictures of him last the year before through spotting scope. I had video of him. I had everything, and and like it just so happened that opening day I had a, a similar you know a, a, another nice bull come in, and I was like. This is this is a big bull. I'm I, I'm an idiot if I pass on this. I don't care. Yeah. And um, that bull went like 340. Yeah. The the bull I killed the year before. So I continued to hunt. My cousin came out, and I, I had that the bull that I wanted inside of 100 yards a couple times, trying to help my cousin kill an animal, and it never came together. And the bull was a very um, he he stuck to the timber. He didn't like being in the open. I mean. I, I didn't have a lot of open pictures of him. I mean, it was like I'd catch him. I'd find him under some giant old growth tree, you know, from like a 10,000 foot peak yeah. across the valley, you know, through a spotting scope. I'd like, God, you know, I know where he's going to go, but it's going to take me four hours to get over there, you yeah. know, because, you know, I'd been hunting him for so long. And he, he stuck to the I, I did catch him out in the open a few times or when he was out, it was in the very, very bottoms. And uh it it was one of those things where he just he 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 was smart he he was he 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 bugled he wasn't one of these unicorn bulls that doesn't bugle or or anything like that he was aggressive he'd push other bulls off and and whatnot so um he made it through the season i showed up um the next year started scouting and found him right away and i was like yes it's on and this was a year that uh i'd picked up the trad bow and kind of committed to to putting my full season efforts in, with a trad bow, and I'm like, hell no, I'm not on that bull. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had some friends come out. They hunted with me a little bit, and I'm like, with that bull in the woods here somewhere, I'm I'm packing my compound. And I hunted with my compound for the first two weeks. And I there was there was one advantage that I could get up on, and I could usually find him somewhere, and. I think four or five days went past after we'd had a pile of snow. There was like 10 inches of snow that opening weekend. And uh, uh, wolves were very, very present that year. And they hadn't been the year prior. So so I'm like, I'm just going to commit to that bull. And I don't want him to walk out at 40 yards because I, I wasn't going to take a 40-yard shot with a trad bow. I mean, yeah. I want to I wanna kill that bull. So I'm like, that's the animal that I'm willing to kill with my compound this year. Um, me and Snyder, Aaron Snyder had a little friendly bet going. So I'm like, you know, I don't care. I'm going to kill this animal with my yeah. downtown and, and I, still be pumped. Yeah, exactly. And, and boom, like after that snowfall with the, the you know, opening day injection of hunting pressure, wolves, all that stuff shortly after opening day, boom, gone. Like I went five days without finding him, and I'd been from this crow's nest of advantage i could see other side hills and oh there's a little six point running like eight cows doing the same thing he did two days ago and yesterday so i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna go down there and i'm gonna try to try to kill that bull you know and uh so after watching him for a couple days trying my hardest to find this big bull i had been after from the year previous i'm like all right and i'm i'm not a I don't like to be labeled as a like, trophy hunter or anything like that. I mean, this is kind of a loaded term. Yeah. 
You're just treasure hunter. That's I'm, what I call it. Uh, yeah. I like, <laughs> I, I like the pursuit as much as anything. Yeah. And yeah. if I, if I, if I put the time into the pursuit, that's when the reward at the end of the, this long pursuit is, mm-hmm. is, is so much cooler. It's not oh, just, yeah. Oh, I fumbled into a, a giant, uh, that bowl do. Yeah. So, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get my trad bow. And my cousin was hunting with me. Um, that day we went, he was going down one ridge. I was going down another. I'm like, that bull's done the same thing for two days. I'm going to, I'm going to go kill him. Um, three days. This was like the third day. And he's like, all right, I'm going to go down that other ridge there. And, you know, we'll just reconvene. And so I, I go down this ridge. I get way ahead of, uh, the elk. He was coming up onto a, a kind of a bench, a flat open sage in the evenings. And the wind wasn't right the night before. So I, I was in a position where if he came up, I got ahead of him. He was going to push his cows right past me. I was going to get a shot. And the wind was wrong. I got into position, and the wind is going right into the hole that he's coming out of. I'm like, no, this isn't going to work. So I boogied. I was like, I, I ran over, got up high on a vantage, and started watching. And he came up on the same bench he had been. And so the next morning, I'm like, I got you now. I know exactly where you're going in because I watched you come out. And he was basically kind of traversing this ridge down into this deep draw. And transitioning onto the north face of the opposite side into the timber it was all old growth so um, i went got way around and down at about the same level that he transitioned it's steep enough that i could see through the timber onto the sage hillside so i'm watching him kind of come down and shortly after first light shortly after first light i hear a bugle right up where i walked down this ridge and there's a trail up there you know, that hunters use. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> I'm like, it's another hunter. Yeah. And anybody that's, that's heard this story is like, they've, you know, they've heard it. And it's like that frustrating feeling like, go find your own yeah. God dang elk. You know, these, you know, I mean, it's like, I can't catch a break. You know, yeah. I lost the bull I'm looking for. Perfect I'm, position this time. This was going to be it. And I'm this like Jack wagon coming down. And it's me. like, okay, yeah, you don't sound like an idiot up there with a call. You sound like you know what you're doing. So whatever. My wind is good. Maybe you'll push him down to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe this will work out in my favor for once. And uh, so this bugle back and forth ensues between these, the bull I'm watching that I'm trying to kill and these hunters, quote, unquote. Yeah. And I'm like, and at one point that bull, like the bugling from in the timber that I could see was like the bull started getting sucked in. I'm like, God, he's going he's gonna to run out on the hillside after he goes into those trees with a little red spot behind his shoulder. <laughs> and I'm like, dang, you know, and then I'm going to, I can't like walk around. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to have to help him haul the damn thing out the rest of the day. <laughs> Um, you know, to be honest, that's yeah. kind of what was going through my head. And he, he went into the timber and then he came back out and I'm like, Oh, there's no blood. Perfect. You know, I was like convinced. And then that bull, instead of dropping down, I'm like, no, now he's not going to want to drop down onto this hillside. Cause there's another, there's a, there's a hunter pretending to be a bull on this hillside yeah. that he wants to take his cows to bed on. So he, so he keeps them level. He keeps checking the cows up on that sage where normally they'd be dropping down. I'm like, yeah, it's about, it's about my luck. Third day to do something the same is when it changes, you know? And, um, so I'm sitting there kind of like thinking, oh, well, what's my move now? You know, do I follow him and try to get him to come back? You know, because these other hunters hadn't come out or tried to pursue. And then I hear, and everybody's heard it that, noise that elk make when they run through the woods, that kind of hollow noise. Mm-hmm. Um, that and, hoof sound. Yep, exactly. Here a mile away. And I was like, holy shit, if there's elk. And I'm like, those were elk. <laughs> and then it like all changed. And, and that's when those, like we were talking the lead cows, you got to watch out for those lead cows. They'll get yeah. you every time. The first two came by, they're all like twitchy and like yeah. looking all over the place. And I'm like, just, I'm like old growth, like huge trees, like zero undergrowth, like be the tree. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like turn into nothing. They won't see you if you, if you can, you know, if you feel it. And, uh, sure enough, they never even pitched it. They never looked my direction. They were just kind of angling up the hill. They went by, kind of went around the corner and then I'm like, boom, you know, 28 yards. 
the calf, you know, and then another cow, another cow. And then I hear a, a little like wussy bugle, like, oh, and it's going to be like a raghorn or something. And, um, you know, like he was like on the trot, he was mm-hmm. trying to, you know, bugle. Yeah. And, um, he kind of comes out on the same trail and I could tell exactly cause he jumped over the same log that all of them did. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's a nice elk. I'm like, this is perfect. And I got an arrow knocked. I'm like ready. I'm in position and I got a, I got a reed in my mouth. I got a Phelps reed in my mouth and, uh, this shameless plug there. Um, <laughs> that was really good. Um, and uh, he he came into the opening that, I mean, looked like an aisle at freaking Walmart, you know, <laughs> down the hill, just eight feet wide and not a, not a tree or limb. Perfect. And I, I let out the most hideous dry mouth reed call <laughs> you could ever think of. And he stopped, like, on a dime, like that perfect in my and i i was like at anchor point yeah and i kind of i pulled back and then i kind of you know felt my anchor with my recurve and pulled through and shot felt good broke clean um and the arrow impact was a little low and a little bit forward right probably within an inch or two above like that point of the elbow like if you look at a broadside elbow. So you're into, you're into some heavy muscle tissue there, but it's, it, I mean, it's it super, it. super lethal as long as you get through, you know, uh, and, um, um, he, he dropped on the shot, kind of rolled down the hill and ran and I'm like listening and listening and then I hear this, this loud crash and it sounded like he, you know, this, this hill that I'm on gradually gets steeper and steeper mm-hmm. as you go down sounded like he'd hit the bottom, like going full speed into like a, a brushy tree yeah. and ran through it. And just now he was on the sage and like continuing to run. So it's like, I have this kind of like elk are the only animal that I get like this with, but they're so incredibly tough. Oh yes. That until that animal is, I see him fall or he's dead. Oh, exactly. It's like, oh, I just, it's just, it's just butterflies, nervousness yeah. and just panic and everything. And, so I like, I sit down, I kind of gather myself. Um, and then I'm like, I walk down there and I mean, the trails just beat into the, you know, one of those trails that, that looks like cattle were running. And, uh, I start looking, I find the front half of my arrow, like broke at the wrap covered in blood. And I find the back half of my arrow all in the same spot. And this is. This is purely my interpretation of what I feel happened. But so I hit him right on the point of that elbow and on his reaction, he basically sheared that arrow off at the wrap, right mm-hmm. at the base of the fletching. And it came out as like his armpit on the other oh, side. Yeah. So and I, half your arrow passed through. Yeah. Like half my arrow passed through and the other half didn't. And it was, it was, you know, instant. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was important. The important part went all the way through and that mm-hmm. was like, all right, good. Cause now I got two holes, you know, yep. I got good blood and it was good red, real dark red blood. And, um, I started following his tracks and he's displacing, you know, huge amounts of dirt as he's galloping down this super steep hill and he goes through these Christmas trees and I'm finding that there's blood everywhere for 10 yards. And then there's nothing until he reaches his front legs forward again so every Mm. time he's like bounding when he brings his leg back he closes that wound yeah and um and i was just like oh man you know because it's wide open i mean i can see you know 60 70 100 yards in any direction and i come through this little thick spot and there's blood all over everything and then i kind of walk around and this bull is the crash i heard he'd i think he died running and he he hit this tree that was kind of dead leaning on something and completely knocked it from its root ball. Like it broke and it was, it was probably eight inches in diameter, but (laughs) rotten enough that he took it out. Yeah. And, uh, it was like laying kind of across him and still snagged up at the top. You know, it was probably 25 feet long. And, uh, that's when it hit me, you know, I just thought, Oh, it's a nice bull. And then, 
you know, any hunter knows you don't focus on the horn. Otherwise I yeah. swear your arrow's going to go. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't care if it's a five point, I'm going to shoot it. I got my recurve. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, it was dumb luck, Yeah. but I, I had this bull targeted and right place, right time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, yeah. I'll take, I'd, I'd rather be cool. lucky than good. <laughs> what was so, your reaction? Would you like realize what bullet was? Well, I walked up and I was like, holy shit. And he's got nice fronts. And I'm like, look at his fifths. It's like, wait a minute. It was like, that's like how it went. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I had, I had no clue how big he was. Uh, you know, I had, I had kind of added him up in my head after scouting him and having pictures of him and stuff like that. And uh, I, like I said, I'd pursued him with a compound for, I think it was the 13th. I killed him on the 13th or the 12th. Yeah. And I'd pursued him with a compound for almost two weeks. <laughs> So, and <laughs> That's I, so cool. the first, the first week of season I had beat on him and yeah. I, I wasn't going to make a mistake. I was going to make the only time I went on on him as solid an opportunity as possible. And there was, there was one, one time early in the season where I'd found him, um, a little higher and a little, little kind of out away from where I'd normally seen him. And I'm like, I'm like, he's getting on his bed. I, I know exactly where he's going to go. And I sat on top of this mountain knowing that it would take me probably an hour, hour and a half to get down there. And I'm like, I think he's going to go down there and he's going to hit that little spring, that water. And sure as shit, like two hours later, it's exactly what he did. He popped out on that open hillside and, and I didn't have the confidence yeah. knowing to, to go down after him with my compound that time. I'm like, you know what? I'd rather, you know, I hadn't seen him in the location that he was in the, the 20 times I'd put eyes on him. So I'm like, I don't know 100% what he's going to do. And I just didn't have the confidence. And that's one of the things that I, I strive for with these bigger animals is, is you get one shot, you know. And if you make a mistake that one time, chances are he's going to be so looped out of his head, you know, you're not going to see the same pattern again. Yep. So. Yeah. That's crucial, man. It's super important to distinguish like, ah, oh, this is probably a 60% chance, you know, that I'm going to mm-hmm. make it happen or 20. Like right now it's a 20% chance it's going to happen. The wind is shifty. Yep. He's not in a great location. Don't go down there. Like just let's see what happens. Let's play well, it and, and where he lived was a hole. I mean, it was like a toilet bowl swirl. Just, I mean, you get lower than about a third into this hole that he lived in. And it, I mean. Just timber? He, it was, it was timber. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was a little bit of open kind of meadowy parky stuff, some broken old growth timber with, you know, t- two draws that kind of met in the bottom, <clears throat> three draws that kind of met three big, deep ravines that kind of all met together. And, uh, it was just so isolated and in such a place where you, you know, there's no, no thing as a consistent wind. And I tried in years past to get down to the bottom. Cause I mean, there's a spot in the bottom that the elk pop out at all the time and they, they wallow and, uh, do, uh, you know, do their elk thing. I, I wouldn't go down there. I, I tried once and I had a, you know, like a three thirty bull at like 70 yards. And I was like, ah, I'll get to 60. And if everything feels good, I I'll shoot him at that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was with a five point and another little rag. He was early. It was like the first weekend of season. And I, I kept creeping down on him and what one of the little rags, like nibbling on some grass or drinking out of the little Creek and threw his head up. And I'm like, Oh, there goes that shit. You know, <laughs> he took them and they ran all the way back up the way they came out, yeah. you know, down draw. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just, you just can't get on them. And it was a windy day with the wind coming up, up drainage, but it's weird because there's like a a ridge that comes out in the middle and then there's a big backdraft from the ridge and it's just one of those spots you can't effectively hunt in. That's why big bulls live there. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, I look for stuff like that. I'm like, you know, what what would be the shittiest place to try to kill an elk? And yeah. you, you you find those holes like in on, on Google Earth on a Forest Service map and you're like, it would suck to kill an elk in here. And mm-hmm. it's like, that's that's where those elk get big. You yeah, know? that's and true. They don't make mistakes often, but when they do, if you know the game, if you know their kind of scenario, their 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 habits. You can even see that you're talking about Google Earth, and you can mm-hmm. see like when you get to where you've been around shitty wind situations enough, mm-hmm. you're like that hole right there. Just looking at Google Earth, you're like that hole right there is going to have 
BS win. Just yep. the way it wraps up around, or like you know, like the, it'll be like a, a canyon that comes up, and then as it comes up, it'll swirl back into itself. Yep. And you know, because that wind is going to come <clears> up that canyon, but it's going to make that loop. It's going to yep. swirl in that pocket. And these are these are high pressure areas too. Lots yeah. of hunters, lots of people. I mean, don't overlook these 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 areas. I have a friend that I met down there that I talk to him on a regular basis. He comes out to Montana and hunts every year. And um, when he's not successful with a bow, he comes out with a rifle. And he said he was he was in another one of these pockets like this. And this guy's like like a killer. This is a this is a legit like um, like he's he's got credentials, you know, for killing beyond what most people have being, you know, ex-military and everything as well. Like you spent some time overseas Mm -hmm. and like has some pretty, I mean, sniper training, stuff like that. So he got on a bull in a similar situation and he, he found this bull one day and in a dark timber in one of these areas where the wind swirls, he got down on the bull the next day. He said, it's the biggest bull he's ever seen. And he's, he spent a fair amount of time hunting elk um got inside of 100 yards got set up with his rifle on a log it was very early in the morning when he got on this bull he said he was the same exact bed this bull was in the day before and he snuck in on it with the wind right and pulled up there and he waited and waited and the bull never got up out of that bed until dark wow so in rifle I mean, season too in rifle season so he 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 was living in that spot knowing that Nothing would be able to approach him from any angle without him knowing, either by wind, noise, or anything like that. And in those situations, he said, my buddy said he could see part of his ass, he could see part of his rack, his ear, but in those dark black timber areas, and he said it was the biggest biggest elk. I mean, when it would turn its head, it, he said, it, you know, when you get a kind of a mm-hmm. picture of, of what it's packing on its head, and that bull just had it figured out. Yeah, so, that's why they get big. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to, um, those areas and things like that, how far from where that bull, when you first scouted him, I guess first, like what time frame did you find him? And then was he there all summer? Same hold? Yeah. Yep. Um, the first time I found him, it was, I remember cause it was, uh, it was the weekend after my wedding and I got married, uh, last weekend in June. So then first week of June, July, yep. essentially. Yep. About right now. Found mm-hmm. that bull and he stayed yep. at the same spot. And he was in the same spot and he was in the same spot the next year. Uh, wow. And some of the bulls that I actually was seeing with him, there was a couple of bulls that had real distinct racks that were, you know, subdominant bulls. They weren't, uh, they weren't the cats ass. They weren't running huge groups of cows, but good, good, solid examples of the species, you know, in that, mm-hmm. that medium category. I was, I was finding 10, 11, 12 miles away down in like Willow river bottoms and stuff like that. Really? There was one bull in particular. He had a, his third and his sword, they like came out of the main beam at the same spot on one side. Mm-hmm. So he had a big third and a sword. Yeah. Well, <laughs> his, his third and his fourth. So yeah. like his third came out and then his sword went up and it almost like webbed together <laughs> on his right beam. And I have pictures of him from two years ago. He summered up with this, this big bull that I ended up killing. And I remember later in the archery season, be it that he got kicked out by another bull or, you know, was just, you know, he'd bounce to a new area and be like, yeah. okay, can I be top dog here? Nope. Yeah. Got to bounce here. And he ended up down mountain. Um, as the crow flies, it was like close to 11 miles. And he was down in a private, private <laughs> land, willow bottom. So crazy. You know, like yeah. flood irrigated grazing area with like 60 cows. Oh, he had to figure it out then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was wearing we'll it out, man. Dream. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I remember, I mean... That's one of the reasons why I love taking pictures of them. You know, when you see one of those, one of those other bulls that maybe has that characteristic in the mm-hmm. rack, you'd be like, I know that bull. You know, yeah. that's, that's part of the fun to me is kind of decoding the, the herd and oh, kind of yeah. learning, so, you know, that's the learning cool where they go. And that's, that's why I think that these bigger bulls, once they get to that status within the herd, they don't, they don't have to travel. Yeah. They can keep their fight for the close cows mm. and they're going to push all the other bulls off. Yeah. So... I, I don't Yeah. And sometimes you have bulls that'll just go 20 miles, go past 500 cows. I know. And they, they're all different. And it's, it's, you know, they go on a walkabout, they do whatever. I mean, yeah. there, there isn't a consistency. I mean, 
that's you can say is going to happen every single time with with any animal but you can say the norm the average you know if you if you run this as far as a rule of thumb goes it's going to help you kind of determine what's yeah. there yeah. so no that's really good advice man and just spend the time glass and time 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 mm-hmm. it's huge and that's the hard part for a lot of people but is it's all relative right like yeah. however much time you want to put in is what what you put into something is what you get out so yep. and the same with hunting and scouting but well thanks man appreciate it that was awesome that yeah was good no, man it was, it was a good talk i had uh i had fun you know bringing up some of my stuff from back when i was a kid and everything, you, know? you, you don't think about that stuff till you had a conversation about it and you're like god yeah that was awesome you know <laughs> so well what what are you up to and uh this year and what do you got planned I mean, big plans for montana idaho um, I'm, like I said, I'm kind of over hunting Montana cause it's so poor here. The hunting, <laughs> it's um, terrible. I'm going to spend some time in Idaho. I can get two tags over there. <laughs> so I can, I can shoot a meat bull with yeah. my recurve. And then, you know, if I, if I have my eye on hey, if you kill a bull with recurve and your compound, that'd be a pretty good year. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I, did, I shot two with a compound, uh, in 16 and they were both pretty decent bulls. Um, I almost pulled back to back days and in Oregon and Idaho, I shot one, drove all night, put meat in the locker, went out that night, shot another bull and freaking lost it. Oh. Last day of season two. Really? Like, yeah, like uh, probably half hour before dark on the last day of Oregon season. Cause I shot that bull in Idaho and had one more day left in Oregon. I was like, got to pull an all nighter. <laughs> yeah. Not smart by the way, <laughs> to drive all night after, <laughs> you know, packing out an elk solo. So definitely yeah, it's closest I've ever been to killing two in the one year, but that's it. You got, you got big plans this year, don't you? I got a lot of tags. Well, I mean, that, that, that's big plans, I guess. Yeah. We'll tag, see. Tags take plans, don't they? I, know. I haven't, I technically haven't bought a third tag. I, I'm really falling back to like, I want to spend more time in, in on less hunts. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Like I want more time on one hunt yeah, and less time, time on like, multiple. Yeah. I don't want to get strung out like a week here, week there, week there. Like I, yeah, it'd be cool to kill three bulls in three States in one year, but I don't know anymore. I'm like, I want to spend two weeks, you know, 14 to 20 days in Montana and then 14 to 20 days. If anybody's going to do it, you can. I mean, geez. <laughs> we'll see. So who finagle it. So. Definitely. All righty, man. We'll appreciate it. Thanks again. Got me all fired up for elk season. I'm yeah, it's, that. it's coming close. It's, <laughs> Dude, it's uh, almost here. What do we got? Like, uh, not even, it's like 60, not even 60 days. Is it? Yeah. So I thought, yeah, you're right. What day is it open? Uh, I think it's the first, Thir- first, oh, first, first, first this year. Well, it's, I mean, where I'll be in Idaho, it's actually August 30th. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Oregon opens really early. Do they? Yeah. I think next year I'm going to go to Oregon for a full week before Montana opens. Rosies are on my list. I want to, I want to do a Rosie hunt. Let's go. So, we'll go Rosie hunt. I would, I would love to. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a different game over there. I mean, <sighs> yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of a love hate though. Like, I don't know if I miss it enough to go yet, back yet. Well, and, and you know, you hear that from guys, you're like, God, you can like, you can like see things here like <laughs> that are far away. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's, <laughs> uh, and, and I think tactics wise, I mean, you gotta, I mean, you gotta get your calling, your calling game has to be strong. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. so, and that's, you will not, there's no glassing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, and that's, that's kind of what I've, I've transitioned into. I've like, okay, I've done the, you know, that big bull, that first bull I killed in Montana. Uh, you can't glass in there. It's all timber. There's, there's probably 10%, open parks and 90% timber. So it's like, you, you want to do something new. I totally get it. Like I, I have more interest right now in spot and stocking elk mm-hmm. just cause I've never really done it. I've yeah. never spot and stocked an elk. I tell you what the, the it's, it's funny that the, the best advice I can give to a new spot and stock guy is sharpen your skills on animals like antelope and deer mm-hmm. it can be white tail. can be mule deer. It can be anything. But if you, if you can, if you can get proficient at killing antelope, elk are like a walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, well, I was fine. It's not 
two antelope with my bow mm-hmm. and then I went and hunted pigs and yeah. my buddy Tony was like, I was like crawling. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, <laughs> I'm like, they're going to see us. He's like, no, no, that's not how it's so like. I started spot and stock on antelope. Yeah. That's all I, that's really all I've ever spot and stocked. Mm-hmm. And so then going backwards, everything should be easier in theory. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And that's the thing is, is I go from, you know, Mon- Montana has an August 15, 900 tag. We were just mm-hmm. talking about that. Yeah. Um, and I love spot and stock antelope. It's a, it's a, it's, it's humbling. It's frustrating. Hone it, your skills before elk season. Yeah. And I tell you what, man, if you got, if you're in like antelope stock mode, I mean, I've got video <laughs> of, uh, like right before elk season opened, um, there was a bull in the sage bedded down that I went up and almost slapped on the ass. Really? Like a little, like five by six, little raghorn, <laughs> five by six. My wife was with me. She was crawling behind me we got to 10 yards and i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna keep going and she's like you're you're fucking crazy man (laughs) it was it was uh and i still have the video on my phone it's 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 incredible it's uh but it was like a sage bush yeah was all that separated me from this bull and it was windy (laughs) as all get i mean like perfect stalking conditions and like if i could have got between those two Sage bushes that were too close together without making any noise. Yeah. And, but he, he kind of heard me and uh, stood up and was like, whoa, what are you? <laughs> and he, he takes off. But he did the, the stereotypical stop broadside look back at like 40 yards. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, if, if I would have if I would have been hunting. But it was during antelope season. And yeah. it was like, this would be a great learning experience for the wife because she was out hunting with me. And um, and I've I've kind of... Fallen into the easy routine. I've killed my, my antelope the first couple of days of season. The last couple of years out of blinds. Um, I killed one with a recurve. I killed, you know, numerous with a compound prior to that. And the, I mean, the, the blind thing, people, people bag on it and stuff like that, but it's, it's a really, really effective way to hunt. Antelope. Oh yeah. And I've been so keyed into elk. It's like, I want to get my antelope taken care of right away. <laughs> That's literally what we were just talking about today. Like, yeah. I would love to go hunt antelope. And I haven't hunted in a loop in a couple of years. I think it, 2014, I shot my last one. So uh, I would love to, but man, I I feel like I have so much scouting to do mm-hmm. with two new elk hunts. And, yep. and I just a lot to do. So I'm like, eh, I could just find a nice water hole, smoke yep. one, some meat on the opening weekend. And, and that's that's what I've done. Yeah. My my buddies come out with me, Sam Soholt. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. For, and he usually has two or three days. And, I always, I mean, he has, I don't think he's killed an antelope with a bow yet, but I always try to stick him in the best blind. Mm -hmm. Um, And it never fails. You know, I go to, oh, I'll go up to that one. We'll see. (laughs) I haven't haven't seen anything come into it in a while. So, and and I get up there and I'm like. I think Sam would probably tell the story differently. Well, yeah. (laughs) Here he can't defend himself. (laughs) And then, you know, I'm, I'm so busy working. That time of year. And I always feel like an ass when it happens, but I like feel my tag and I'm like, Oh, see you, Sam. I gotta yeah. get some work done so I can, so I can disappear for yeah, a couple that, of weeks during September. Part. Like you're trying to get life in order so you can leave for 30 days. Yeah. yeah um, tough to, to go antelope hunting. So. so we'll see what happens. Definitely. Well, yeah. I mean, if you, you got a 900 tag, man, we'll have to talk. Maybe, yeah. maybe I got a shitty blind I can put you in too. <laughs> 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 so oh, that's perfect all right buddy well been good thank you again awesome and, uh, yeah. thanks for having me do it again all right later this episode brought to you by backcountry fuel box backcountry fuel box is my newest creation it's a monthly subscription box full of backcountry meals snacks bars and all kinds of cool high energy options for your next backcountry adventure. I started the box because I wanted a way to try out all the cool new backcountry food options that were on the market. And also, so I would always have stuff on hand for my own adventures. There's just so many cool new options available. The June box had all kinds of great products and new companies that I think most people have probably never heard of. Brands like Four Points Bars, Peak Refuel, Dark Mountain Energy, just to name a few. All in all, the June box was packed full with 10 awesome products and discount codes to all the companies within the box. Enough to taste test a few of the items and to hide the rest in my tote for September. 
The box is thirty three thirty a month, but if you use the TRO at checkout, use the TRO code, you'll get the box for twenty nine ninety seven a month, and it is full of awesome stuff that you're actually going to use. Also, I just want to say a big shout out to all of you who have been sharing the box when you get it on social media. I am thoroughly humbled by the dozens and dozens of people that have been helping grow this thing, and it really does mean the world to me. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. There's a whole bunch of awesome stuff coming from the, this whole backcountry fuel project, and you guys have been awesome and instrumental in helping me get there and uh, kind of grow this whole thing. So if you guys haven't yet, go check it out. Give it a try. There's literally zero commitment. I'm not trying to scam anyone. I just want everyone to stay signed up because the box is so awesome. Head over to backcountryfuelbox.com. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. Get signed up if you want to be a part of the July box. All right. Thanks, guys. This episode of Wapiti Wednesday brought to you by Phelps Game Calls. Phelps Game Calls are hands down my favorite diaphragms. And I've tested, I've tried out just about every diaphragm on the market. And the amp frame is what I carry. The amp frame, not only is it is extremely easy to use, but they're the most consistent calls you can find and extremely durable. As someone who can blow out a diaphragm in just a few days, the first time I used one of the new amp frame calls, I was blown away at how long it lasted. I can get a few weeks out of a single Phelps diaphragm versus a couple days out of just about any other diaphragm on the market. Personally, I like the amp gray and the amp white, but if you don't have any idea what to use or what to try, just grab four or five of them and see what you like. You know, some of you guys are going to like locating on one and some of you guys are gonna like the sexy cow calls on another but either way i think you'll be able to use any of them they all sound great and they all work super well uh just kind of all on personal preference a couple of you guys have asked me about the big bat bugles and if they're necessary for me 100 percent, i am naked in the woods without my bat bugle the phelps bat just gives me so much more reach when i'm bugling as far as being able to be louder and carry a bugle farther into a canyon if you only want to be the kind of guy that slips into a herd herd of elk and doesn't do a whole lot of screaming challenge bugles uh, even the, just having the bat as a locating tool is crucial. You can carry that bugle so much farther, locate a bull, a bull from farther away. And to me, it's an essential item in my toolkit. Go get yourself some Phelps game calls before they sell out. Before season comes, get to practicing, get good at it. Use the TRO code and you'll get free shipping off your entire order. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Wapiti Wednesday. If you guys have questions that either we didn't cover in this episode or you just like to see in future episodes, be sure to drop us a line at info at therichoutdoors.net or be sure to join the Rich Outdoors Insiders Group on Facebook for more information as well as some really cool gear giveaways. Thanks for listening, guys.